It's a very, very different to be the president, and particularly be the president at this Southern black women's school yes. that's used to doing things a certain way, uh, a good way, I'm, I'm guessing, but those, those may not be your ways. Uh, what, what kind of challenges did you meet mm. and face and win? Well, because you know the South, you will know that one of the first challenges that I confronted at Spelman was stonewalling. Mm. You know, Southern folk, and I want to say particularly Southern black folk, really don't like conflict. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, and I'm really using huge stereotypes, you know, I'm coming from a northern school, I'm coming from Hunter, mm -hmm. I'm coming from New York City, where, you know, a lot of it is in your face. That's right. You know, and you want to fight about this mm -hmm. theory? I'll take you on about this mm -hmm. theory. And you want to have this change in the administration? I'll tell you why it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Not at Spelman. Mm -hmm. Very, you know, let's not have any conflict here. Let's just, and so I'm raising ideas. I'm suggesting things. And I'm just getting, I'm not getting resistance mm -hmm. in the sense of taking me on. Right. I'm just getting, let's just avoid this. Mm -hmm. They don't want to engage. Let's not engage mm -hmm. in this. And so, in many ways, I had to, I had to reconnect with my southernness. Mm -hmm. I had not lived in the South since that one year at Fisk, 1953 to 54. And so I really took some counsel there with myself, and I started reading about and thinking about what is the nature of being Southern. And once I reconnected with a good deal of that, I'm not saying it solved the problem, but it helped me to administer far better. Secondly, I really think that my own openness um, what was useful. It, it, it made me accessible. It diffused some of the sense of, here comes the president, which is somewhat assumed to be the proper stance within our HBCUs. Oh, yes. And it made, um, it made for an early, I hope I'm not overstating this, it made for a kind of early affection um, that I admit I took full advantage of. It was so clear with the students. I mean, the love affair that I had with my young sisters, I think is, is to rarely be matched. A faculty ain't the same thing. Well, I was just thinking that the students naturally would be happy to see you. Change for them is four years. And so whatever you do can't be very upsetting or threatening to them, and you're a welcoming person, but the faculty they That's have a, a longer thing. view than Absolutely. four years. Absolutely. And the administrators. And some very peculiar things happened as a result of Spellman's history and mine coming into the same place. For example, this may be my best example, in fact. I remember saying to colleagues from around the country, you know, I am surprised, to tell you the truth, shocked by how little faculty governance there is at Spelman. There must be more faculty governance. And people are saying, Johnetta, now wait a minute. Do you know what you're asking for? You've got a situation of, in quotes, power and authority, and you're asking to share this? And the answer for me was yes. Because my long-term view of that school and of the academy is it without genuine faculty governance, not over-exercised, not exploited, mm -hmm. but appropriately engaged in is essential for the health and the success of a college or a university. So who becomes the major proponent of faculty governance? Mm -hmm. The president. A moment ago we were talking about 
governance, faculty governance at Spelman and how you became an advocate for it, oddly for a president who generally wants to see less of that. Uh, but what else did you find lacking at Spelman or missing at Spelman that you had expected to find from your experience at other mm -hmm. institutions? What was the norm elsewhere that wasn't the norm at mm -hmm. Spelman? At the risk of reducing things to, to simplistic lines, there wasn't as much intellectual fervor, as mm -hmm. much intellectual agitation, as much intellectual life mm -hmm. as I had been used to. And this is not to say that, that all professors were just sort of taking the, you know, the easy road and not really raising questions and moving to, to points of, of, of real change in terms of their thoughts, but it did grab me as being pretty, as a pretty quiet place intellectually. Mm -hmm. I'd like to think that I was able to stir that pot a little bit. Now, you know, your use of the term administration leads naturally to the Clinton administration. You become uh -huh. a part of the transition team uh, for education for incoming President Bill Clinton, and immediately a firestorm erupts. Two your, mile of world politics, firestorm. Yes, uh, an explosion. Your politics, Cuba. What, what, what did that do to you? I imagine this had never happened to you before. It had not. I mean, mm -hmm. nothing that was even close to the intensity and I would say the viciousness mm -hmm. of that red baiting. It was horrible. I mean, there, there's no, no word that I can use more accurately than horrible. And for me, Julian, it was horrible fundamentally because I was the president of Spelman. Mm -hmm. And so here was a moment when my worst nightmare could come true. And that is that I could bring harm to Spelman. Mm. You remember a little earlier, I had said that I was convinced that Marion not only thought I could do good mm. for her school, but I would never do anything do harm, to harm. Right. And it, it just, it was, it was a horrible nightmare mm -hmm. to live through. And I must tell you that not only Marion, but at that time, Robert Holland, Bob Holland, who you may remember for a while, was the CEO of Ben & Jerry's. Mm -hmm. And that board stuck by me in a way that was truly admirable. <coughs> and that I am convinced <laughs> cut the possibility that I could bring harm to Spelman. When they came out immediately in my support, then <coughs> where, where, where could anyone go with this? But it was a wretched period to live through. What about students? I imagine for students, this is an unusual thing for them to find themselves in the middle of. These young people, <coughs> excuse me. Anyway, this is unusual for them to find the head of their institution under subjected to this kind of attack. And it may be that they're saying, you know, could this be true? Is she a bad person? How did they react? hate to be schmaltzy, but <laughs> they reacted lovingly. Um, you know, the, it, it, it would have been hard, I think, for Spelman students to really convince themselves mm. that the person they knew, who they saw walking around campus and who they would <coughs> vie to walk with in early morning walks, or with whom they sat in open office hours, or who led them to the polls to vote, that all of a sudden this woman was the most dreaded thing uh, in America, a communist. Yes. Uh, it was just, it did not compute for them. And so, you know, I got a lot of Dr. Cole, don't you worry, I'm with you, you know, this is nonsense. But I tell you the truth, a whole lot of students just sort of, to use their language, blew it off. Mm. But it's amazing how much salience red baiting had in this period, this modern period. 
I mean, the menace of the Soviet Union, we've got to think that's yesterday, that's history. Uh, wh why did this bite so strong? Do you think it had anything to do with both your race and your gender? That you somehow, the combination of female, black, and red, just too much? Was just, was just well, I think a lot of or things it was too easy. A lot of things contributed. You know, do not underestimate the Miami Cuban community. Mm. Do not ever underestimate that cu community. The proximity of Atlanta to Miami, mm. I think, was important. Mm. Uh, secondly, and perhaps I overstate things, but I think a lot of folks saw the Secretary of Education post as having far more influence than it really does, mm -hmm. ever did, and ever will. And the notion that, you know, someone they could so dread would be in that position. And then thirdly, I think it was an early sign that Bill Clinton was going to have some folk coming at him in all kinds of ways. It was an experience I do not want to live through again was also an experience that I think with the end of the Cold War and the, in quotes, dread of communism, we should not take deep breaths over and say, oh, never to happen again. Because what I went through can be reconfigured and it can be reconfigured in the era in which we live where to question things that are going on now in the aftermath of September 11th is to set oneself up to be unpatriotic. Oh, we already see people losing jobs and uh, being condemned and uh, threatened and so on because they do dare to question. It's, uh, it's a scary, scary phenomenon. I've not thought of the possibility of replicating this Cold War hostility in a new phase under a new guise, in a under new way. Under a new guise. Uh, and, and it is amazing that Clinton seems to me to attract a higher level of enmity for relatively little cause than any public figure in my lifetime. In my just lifetime amazing. as well. In my lifetime as well. I don't know what it is about him. I don't know either. Yeah. Sometimes I think might be a touch of color there. He's just going to attract it. I don't know. It, I don't so, know. Well, I think that's a, surely a part of it, that he does have this, for better or worse, strongly, weakly, this affinity for African Americans, and that's got to be so upsetting it to so many to people. It has got to go to the last yeah. nerve yeah. of lots of folk. Indeed.